You may now take off your face mask if you choose to do so. And as a reminder, please uh, remain in your seat for the remainder of the service unless there's just an absolute emergency. And if that's the case, please put your face mask back on and as you stand up, give the people around you a chance to put theirs on. And then at the end of the service, we'll ask everyone to put their face mask back on. Well, I welcome everyone to our worship service today. Aloha. It's so good to see everyone. I'm Alan Akana, the Kahu, or pastor of the church, and I uh, see some unfamiliar faces. And if you're here visiting, uh, a special welcome to you. And also, if there's anybody here for the very first time, be sure to see the deacons afterwards. If you haven't already, we have a special little gift for you and also a card for you to fill out to tell us a little bit more about yourself. And in our bulletins, we have um, some announcements that begin on pages four and five. And I would just call your attention to our temporary worship guidelines during COVID-19, if you're not familiar with those already. And also just know that if you would like to make a donation to the church, you may do that online or bring up your offering here or in the two baskets in the back, since we don't pass around an offering plate during the pandemic. So those are our basic announcements that I wanted to call your attention to. I did want to thank everybody again for your generosity over the last couple of months to the young family out at Salt Pond where there's a, a homeless encampment really. There's people in tents just living out there that really um, have no place else to go. And uh, we chose a young mother with a, a one-year-old toddler that I got to visit with last weekend. And uh, they... Um, the mother 
was just deeply, deeply appreciative of all the help that our congregation has given. And the whole community, uh, as I was walking up, they're like, oh, you're the pastor of that church that's so generous and helpful to everybody out here. So it really um, warmed my heart just being out there um, representing all of you. So thank you for all of you that have made donations to share Aloha. And then I understand we have at least one birthday this week. Faye Bartels, happy birthday. It's good to see you and beautiful lays that you and Belinda both have on. Are, are there any other birthdays I might be missing this week? Well, happy birthday, Faye. And um, today is the third Sunday in Lent. And we've been going through the signs in the scriptures that point to God during Lent. And I, I'm basically following the lectionary and looking at the signs that point to God in the scripture passages that we have provided for us in, the, in our denomination. And today's sign is the body of Christ. And so I've been spending some time this week thinking about how the human body can actually be a sign that points to God. And in the scriptures, we're told that the church is the body of Christ, and as we as individual members are a part of the church, we're also part of the body of Christ. And so, as we begin our worship service, I invite you to think about how a body, and it could be a body of people, or it can be an individual person, but how has a body been a sign of God's loving presence to you in the past? Good morning. Today's call to worship and opening prayer are adopted from Psalm 19. Let us worship God, for the heavens are telling the glory of God, and the earth proclaims God's handiwork. Let us offer praise to God, for the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving our souls, and the commandments of the Lord are clear, enlightening our eyes. Let us give thanks to God, for the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 21. Listen for the word of God. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make for yourself an idol. You sh I'm sorry. You shall not make for yourselves an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing generation of those who reject me children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of your Lord God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son of your or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male, or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. 
When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Today's gospel reading is from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. Listen for the word of God. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. May God bless the reading of the word, and may our hearts be open to receiving it. flows before your throne. Take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I long to be deeper in love. Sunrise to sunrise, I will seek your face. Drawn by the Spirit to the promise of your grace. My heart has found in you a hope that will abide here in your presence forever satisfied take me deeper deeper in love with you jesus hold me close in your embrace take me deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I long to be deeper in
take me deeper, deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I long to be deeper in love. How I long to be deeper in love. In March of 1882, construction began at La Sagrada Familia Basilica in the Spanish city of Barcelona. And about a year later, the chief architect resigned and Antony Gaudi took over and instilled his very unique style into this architectural project. In fact, to this day, it's considered one of the boldest and most outrageous pieces of architecture in modern history. Gaudi wanted to describe the life of Jesus through the art and architecture. And I wasn't quite aware of what I was getting into when I visited La Sagrada Familia two years ago when I was on my sabbatical, but I was walking toward what I later discovered was the passion facade. And this whole side of the building that I was walking towards was dedicated to the passion of Jesus, the last week of his life. And over the grand doors of that facade is this relief sculpture of Jesus on a cross that is just so unique. It stands out in my mind as if it were just yesterday. And the whole facade is about the final week of Jesus. I later discovered that every facade had a new story to tell, and as I walked around, I saw the glory facade, which was dedicated to the glory of God through the life of Jesus, and part of that was the ascension as Jesus rose up into heaven after his resurrection. Well, I finally made it all the way around to what was, at least now, the front opening, uh, the, the, the welcoming area, and where you actually enter into the basilica. And that's the nativity uh, um, facade. And, and it basically shows everything from the birth stories, from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, from John the Baptist to Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph, the Magi. Every facade had a story to tell, and Gaudi's intention was when people would visit the basilica, they would experience the entire life and experience of Jesus Christ through art and architecture. Well, I have to tell you that just looking at the exterior of the building was worth a trip to Barcelona for me. But then I entered into the sanctuary itself, this big interior space, and it's as close as I've ever had to an out-of-body experience with architecture in my life. There's something about the way it was designed that just causes your eyes to be lifted up to heaven. The pillars are reminiscent of tall trees. And as you're inside, you feel almost like you're outside in this magical place or maybe even heaven. And as you walk from one part of the interior to the other, it's as if you're walking through a rainbow because the way that all of the grand windows made from stained glass are built. There's just all these colors shining everywhere throughout, and it was just one incredible experience. I felt by the time I left, and actually I have no idea how long I was there. I really lost all sense of time, 
but I know I was there much longer than I had expected because I had a ticket to go somewhere else and I almost didn't get there on time. But I remember being inside thinking, I have experienced the life and story of Jesus through art and architecture like I didn't ever know before was possible. And more than anything, I felt the presence of God. It was truly an amazing experience, something that I had been looking forward to for a very long time. But I had no idea till I actually got there just how enriching that experience would be to my own spirituality. It really had an influence, an impact on my life. It, it truly touched me just from being there. The details, the, the space, the color, everything just felt so holy and sacred to me. I want you to know that in our gospel lesson this morning from John chapter 2, that's the kind of experience people anticipated when they went to the temple in Jerusalem, including Jesus, who in the story went there with his disciples. To go to the temple was to go to the one place amongst the Jewish people in that nation where there was a building that would truly make you feel the presence of God like no other building in the world. But before I get into that, let me give you a little background of the temple, just so you know what Jesus and his disciples were actually looking forward to and getting into in our story from John chapter 2. So this was actually the, the second temple of the Jewish people. The first one was built by King Solomon, King David's son, about a thousand years before Jesus was born. And at the time, it was the grandest, most magnificent building in the nation. It was where people went to have that kind of out-of-body spiritual experience with God and with God's people. Unfortunately, very soon after that temple was completed, warring nations began invading Jerusalem and the, the surrounding area. Uh, I think first was probably Egypt. And then along later came the Assyrians. And over hundreds of years, people kept attacking Jerusalem. And as they did, they destroyed the temple a little more each time. And by the time King Nebuchadnezzar had come along from the empire of Babylon, or, or by the time he was done with Jerusalem, there, there was virtually nothing left of the temple. It was considered completely destroyed. It was a total loss. So this was, I think, sometime around 600 years or so before the birth of Christ. And so for many years, people that went to Jerusalem had no temple to go to anymore, and they deeply felt that loss. Well, less than 100 years after the temple was completely destroyed, Cyrus the Great, who was king of Persia, now known kind of as the, the country or the region of Iran, he decided that he was going to rebuild the temple for the Jewish people. And this temple, like the first one, was a grand edifice. People were so happy that Cyrus had rebuilt their temple for them, and they went there. They pilgrimaged to this temple from all over the known world. If you were Jewish, you went there at least once in your lifetime, and many of the Jewish people went there regularly if they could make it for, for the high holy days like Passover. Well, as you can imagine, over hundreds of years, about 500 years, there were still warring nations and People had their eye on Jerusalem because it was just kind of sitting there at the crossroads of Asia and Africa and Europe. And so there were a lot of close calls where the temple could have certainly been completely destroyed, like when Alexander the Great was conquering almost all, of, well, basically all of the Middle East and, and much of Asia, all the way to India, he was about to attack Jerusalem, and the leaders of Jerusalem realized that they had better back down and put their negotiating skills 
uh, together pretty quickly. And fortunately, were, they were able to keep Alexander the Great from attacking the temple. But I want you to know that over the years, as Greek culture continued to be the dominant culture in all of that part of the world, it wasn't so much physical wars that were destroying the temple, but it was Greek culture itself. So when people came into Jerusalem and basically took over, they would introduce their practices. For example, some of these people with their Greek backgrounds would bring their Greek gods into the temple. And this obviously was very distressing to the monotheistic Jewish people that all these other gods people were bringing into the temple. They hated that. There were other things that some of the Greek leaders did that the Jewish people found really, really offensive. Probably the most offensive was bringing pigs into the temple to sacrifice to Greek gods. Now, I want you to know it got so bad that many of the Jewish people started just hating the people around them for doing things like this. They, they were opposing Greek culture, many of them. And one day, there was a priest in the temple, and one of the Greek authorities came and ordered him to make a sacrifice to one of the Greek gods. And this particular priest would have none of it. His name was Mattathias. And Mattathias actually killed the guy. And virtually all of the Jews of Jerusalem joined him in taking Jerusalem back. And so for a period of time, the Jews ruled Jerusalem and all the surrounding region. But as you probably know, the Roman Empire took over Jerusalem eventually in about, it was less than 100 years before Jesus was born. There were different rulers that the emperor placed there, but King Herod, known as Herod the Great, eventually was the ruler, and, and he was trying his best to appease the Jewish people. And one of the great favors he did for the Jews of the time is he decided to expand the temple and make it even more glorious and better than it ever had been before. During this time, the temple mount, where the temple was located, doubled in size. He added stone that was white, that made it, the, the white face made it just so much more glorious. He added porticos, he added new stairways, he added balconies. And there was this huge temple square where people could gather now. It took 46 years to get the temple to the point where the rededication happened. And this happened right about the time when Jesus visited there, just as he was beginning his public ministry. So you can imagine Jesus' entire life, during that time, the temple was being newly built and rebuilt, modernized in a sense. And everybody knew that you had to go see the brand new temple because it was out of this world. So Jesus, this is probably his first trip to the, to the temple, and certainly after it was newly rededicated, he and his disciples are up in Capernaum, which is on the very northern shores of the Sea of Galilee, and he was attending a wedding with his mother and his disciples, and it's where he turned the water into wine. And John, the gospel writer, tells us this was Jesus' first, this was the first of Jesus' signs. Well, it's about 80 miles or so from the very northern shores of the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem. So Jesus probably took at least four, maybe five days with his disciples to travel the entire way throughout Galilee, Samaria, 
Judea. He finally gets to Jerusalem, and the entire time, they are all looking forward to celebrating Passover in the newly dedicated temple. This place where they're all expecting to have this out-of-body experience. And they arrive there expecting that. And instead, Jesus sees cows in the temple. Jesus sees birds, doves in the temple. Jesus sees sheep. And you can imagine when you see those things, what you smell. Jesus was expecting this spiritual, holy experience, and instead, he gets to this stinking temple. It smelled to high heavens because of all these animals and their dung. And he realizes he's just entered the largest marketplace he's ever seen in his life. People are using religion to make money. People are using his faith, which he deeply loved, to make a profit. And they're, in his mind, they were ruining that holy, sacred building and space that had just been dedicated to God, and he was furious. He made a whip out of cords, and he chased out all the cows, all of the sheep, all the people who own them. He went over to the money changers and knocked over their tables and threw their money on the floor and demanded that they leave. He was a little nicer, actually, John tells us in the gospel, to the people who had doves. He didn't, he didn't knock over the doves or send them out. He just said, basically, get out of here, too. So Jesus had just cleared the temple of everything that he found offensive. And the Jewish leaders, of course, had heard about this and probably heard what was going on because imagine the commotion that he must have been making as he's throwing stuff all over the place and whipping the animals to get out and everything. The Jewish leaders show up and they want a sign. In fact, they demand a sign. What sign do you have? Basically, to show us that you have the authority to do this. We demand a sign. And Jesus said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Now, to say that the Jewish leaders were confused would be an understatement. It, it's as if I went to La Sagrada Familia, and I started just throwing things around and said, tear this whole thing down, which, by the way, has taken about 140 years to build so far, it's still not done. But imagine what those leaders thought when this rabbi from Galilee comes down and says, destroy this temple, this temple that was the pride of all the Jewish people, what in the heck is he talking about? And what's this business about him raising it in three days? It took 46 years just to make it as beautiful as it is now. But John tells us in the gospel that Jesus wasn't actually talking about the temple as a building. He was talking about his body. And the disciples didn't really catch what that was all about until after he died and three days later rose from the dead. But the point here is Jesus' body was a sign. It was a miraculous sign because Jesus was God. Jesus was sent by God and took on a actual, an actual human body. And that's what he was talking about. And John, the gospel writer, is pointing to the fact that this human body is a sign of God. In fact, it is the most important, the most spectacular sign of all. Jesus' body. Now, here's Jesus standing in this temple that took 46 years just to redo and to rededicate. And John is basically saying, that doesn't compare at all to Jesus' body. Think about it, how 
Something holy, sacred, divine can literally embody human flesh. The point here is that Jesus as a body, infused by life, by God's breath, was able to point to God. Now, a sign, according to the Gospel of John, is anything that points to, or, or uh, the sign of Jesus' body is what points to his identity, his purpose, and his authority. So here's Jesus talking about this sign from God. And the Gospel of John is basically saying, this is the most important sign of all. Now, sign shows up in the Gospel of John just in these 11 chapters that have to do with the public ministry of Jesus about 16 times. So that's more than once per chapter. John talks about the signs, over, the signs of Jesus over and over and over. And of all the signs, his body is the most important. So what does that mean? What did that mean to Jesus and what does it mean for us today? Well, the body of Jesus is how he actually does the vision that God sent him into the world to share with everyone. And so Jesus is in this world sharing this vision of God's love for everyone and peace for everyone and justice for everyone, goodness and abundant life for everyone. And it's through the body that does that. And it's a reminder that sometimes we get so caught up in spiritual things that we forget that this flesh that we have is how this vision comes about. For for it was Jesus' feet that took him to be among the most marginalized people in his society among the people that nobody else seemed to care about or love at all, the homeless, the sick, the the people that were just thought very, very little of, if anything at all, because of who they were or their circumstances in life. It's Jesus' actual feet that brought him there, and it was his hands that actually healed them, gave them bread, gave them fish. His hands hands, his physical hands were used to actually embody this grand vision that God had for this just and peaceful and loving world. Jesus' lips and his tongue were used to share with everybody the possibility of this new vision in the world, God's love for you and you and everyone else. And the entire body of Jesus was used as a sacrifice for all of humanity, in fact, all of creation, to show physically that God loves each and every one of us. And together we can demonstrate that, and furthermore, we can be that body together. So as you read through the Gospel of John, You see that word sign show up over and over again. And you also see that the purpose of the sign is for belief. In fact, believe, the verb, believe, believed, believes, believing, shows up about a hundred times in John's gospel. It's probably his favorite word next to Jesus and God. The purpose of using our bodies is so that people will believe. And sometimes we think, oh, if I only believe the right things, then I know what to do. But Jesus, through John's gospel, is, is saying, do those things with your body, and belief actually follows. Love people, and you feel love towards them, in other words. But believing is the purpose of the signs. 
And sometimes we think, oh, if I just believe all the right things, the right theology, the right doctrines, and, you know, I don't know if it's supposed to be Catholic or UCC or Presbyterian or Methodist or whatever, because they're all a little bit different, but sometimes we think if we believe the right things, then we will live this abundant life. But Jesus is telling people, or John is telling people in his gospel about Jesus, that his whole point is, use your body, your feet, your hands, your lips, your tongue, your whole body, and you will love people. You will believe because you will see it happening. So it's so important for us to see that that's what Jesus did. Yes, the temple was grand. And I look at this building and I think, wow, how beautiful this church is and how much love has gone into this church over the last six years or so since we first, talk, first started talking about a capital campaign. But I want you to know that in God's eyes, what is really impressive is you showing up in your body and you using your body to show God's love. This, this is the beautiful shell that we have to come together and it is a holy place. But you are the body of Christ. You are the feet of Christ. We together go to those places where marginalized people are today on the borders of society. And we find those people at Salt Pond living in tents who are homeless because we are the feet of Jesus. We are his body. We are the ones that bring things like tarps and diapers and food to a young family, to a young mother that has a toddler living in a tent. We are the ones who show up with our lips and our tongues and we say, we love you and we're just here because God loves you and we wish the very best for you. And we are the ones that show up with our bodies because that's what we do. That's how God's love is shown in the world. And so today, as this service comes to a close, I would invite you to think about how God is inviting you to use your body to show God's love to someone today. And hopefully, a whole lot of someones will see God through this temple called our bodies. Amen. Now it's time for the sharing of joys and concerns. And we have a few coming up here right now. Thank you. And the very first one is Happy Birthday, Faye, from Belinda. So we do wish you a happy birthday. And from Judith, a joy, a new baby great-granddaughter, Eden Foley. The parents are Jimmy and Monica Foley, grandparents John and Marissa Foley, and Auntie Missy Foley. So. Wonderful news. Congratulations to the entire Foley family. And as we begin our time <clears throat> of prayer today, I would remind you that on page seven, we have the prayers that we pray for during the week and continue to, to pray for those and also add to that by letting us know what your prayers are. And I, I pray from this list every week, and I know many of you do as well. And as we begin our time together, I invite you to contemplate for just a moment in silence how you might use your body today, this week, to share God's love with someone. And after a moment of silence, I'll lead us in a verbal prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, I give you thanks for all of the bodies that are here today. Thank you for 
all of the new bodies for births that we celebrate and also birthdays. God, I give you thanks for how so many people in this church have used their bodies to express your love, how we have showed up, several of us at least, at Salt Pond to deliver goods to people who are in need. For people like Kathy Evans, who is spending months out of her life at a refugee camp in Lesbos, Greece, helping people who so desperately need help. How many of us are using our professions in medicine and education and other forms of health care and in so many other ways to bring love, your love, to people in places all over this island and indeed all over the world. And God, as we continue to figure things out as a nation in terms of our politics and our racial issues and the many things that divide us, I pray, O oh God, that your compassion would rule the day in the end and that you would give that compassion and your wisdom to all of our leaders at all levels of government here in this country, in this state, in this county, and in places all over the world. And God, as we continue to struggle with this pandemic, and as we continue to have differences in opinions and differences in how we see what needs to be done, God, may life and love be foremost in our thoughts and in the thoughts of those who make decisions for us. But may each of us know that life is such a precious gift and the sacrifices we make for ourselves and for others are so worth it. Oh God, for our bodies, we give you thanks for the breath that we breathe throughout the day, we give you thanks for the heartbeat that happens constantly, even without us ever thinking about it. And for all the good things that we do for ourselves and for one another, for family, for friends, for community, to keep our bodies healthy and alive, we give you thanks. And God is we consider people who are struggling these days, who are sick and injured. We pray for their healing. We pray for their comfort. And we pray that they would know your love through the loving hands surrounding them, the bodies that you have sent to them for healing and for comfort. And God, for those who have recently lost loved ones, we do ask God for comfort and for peace and also for those in hospice care. May their transitions be as comfortable as possible, and may their family members and loved ones be filled with hope as they transition from this life to the next. Oh God, we give you thanks that you are present with us in body, in spirit. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that reminds us constantly of your loving presence. And it is in the name of our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, that we give thanks and pray for all these things. Amen. And just as a reminder, after the Huda, just take that precious moment to just meditate on your experience. Uh, I just want to give an explanation why we chose Mokihana Lullaby, written by Lewis Kaukahi and and Loyal Gardner. And the Mokihan is a flower found on Kauai. And the, um, the verses say, you know, this is uh, Heo Ikanani, you know, proud of its beauty. Nani's beauty. It says Nani Maoli, you know, a beauty unsurpassed. And it says it's the, it's the Mokihana. Onauna is fragrance. And the Mokihan is a sweet fragrance, if you ever experienced that. And the second verse is it's woven into a lei. Entwined with a small leaf, maile. You notice the, the maile is, is this vine that is picked. And a kawaii, for some reason, our maile is, has a small leaf. So it's sort of uh, too kawaii as far as that is concerned. 
And it's woven with love. It says, woven with love. Vili'ia meki aloha. A love that will never be forgotten. And the hui says, mahalo no ia oe. Mahalo, you should think of it as saying thank you. But when you use it in this content, it says, mahalo no ia oe. It says, blessings to you. And it says, blessings to you, my friend. The reason we pick this is because um, in, in the Hawaiian musicians, a lot of times the, they use a flower as a metaphor of a friend or of a being or of someone. And we picked this one because the mokihana, if you ever saw the mokihana, you wouldn't even think it's a flower. It, it doesn't have all the, those nicely shaped petals. There's no vibrant color to it. It's just a, the best I can say is it's a green berry. It looks like a green berry. But its fragrance is unsurpassed and, and everlasting, its essence. And if you think of it as Jesus, you know, he's such a simple life. He wasn't full of grandeur in terms of outwardly color, I guess. And that's what you think of the Mokihana. If you can interchange the Mokihana with Jesus, if you can interchange the, the Maile Lau Li'i li, the small leaf Maile, as all of us, it says that we're entwined, you know, this Mokihana, Jesus is entwined with the small leaf Maile, entwined with us, woven with aloha, with love and a love that will never be forgotten. May ke aloha ho ina ole. Ya 
masks on and uh, please keep them on until you are either back inside your vehicle or off the property and thank you so much Rose for that beautiful hula and Doug for the song that's actually one of my favorite Hawaiian songs and um, the 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 words and um, the meaning are just so special um, but also the melody it's just it's just a beautiful beautiful song and as I was watching Rose dance, uh, doing her hula, I thought, what a wonderful way to use our body as a sign to point to God. And as a reminder, we all have that opportunity in one way or another. So think about that this week as you leave this place and think about how you might serve God. I invite you to stand now for the benediction. May we go from this place using our bodies to be the sign that points to God, to God's love, to God's grace. And may the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and comfort of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>